This is Pryos and I'm a professional gambler. Today we will talk about my flop or seabed uh, strategy in general. And afterwards we will listen to another um, poker player who will also give his thoughts on the flop seabed strategy. And yeah, if you want to only listen to my advice, only watch the first part and yeah, the second part if you only also want about want to know about Phil Garfond and my remarks to that. So let's start with my seabed strategy. So there is one big elephant in the room. GTO it's called. And in general, this is a good baseline, especially if you play against someone you don't know or against someone whose frequencies are really good and who do you think is not exploitable? In this case, you should stick to the GTO solutions. Therefore, it's um, necessary that you know what GTO su suggests on certain board types and stuff. And you can just, yeah, you need to learn that. That's as simple as that. And you can either do it with uh, PLO Vision, that's by the way the tool from Phil Galfons, or with PLO Trainer, that's the one I use usually. This is the one from uh, Jane Endes. Links are in the description below. Yeah. Anyways, this is a good baseline, but I almost never play GTO. This is because usually players have certain tendencies. Let me try to get rid of where is it this that you can see it usually someone is either too tight or too loose against continuation bets so um let's do here the so we can either go in this direction too tight and if people are too tight, then I would change to an exploitative ex um, approach. And if someone is too tight, you, you want to see bet more than GTO suggests. So in this case, you would see bet more and you don't necessarily increase the value portion of the uh, seabed, but you bluff more. And then there's also the opposite of that when someone is too loose and if someone is too loose what you want to do is you see bet less against this guy because you have less fold equity you still have the same same value portion or at best you probably should also um re not reduce it to to uh, you should increase the value portion of your c bets because he's calling simply too much junk and you need to protect your hand and also extract value. And you can extract thinner value than against other opponents because this guy is never folding. So you bluff less and value bet more against him. But in total, this should end up you uh, having less continuation bets. Um, by the way, in order to determine if someone is too loose or too tight, you can use a tool that's called Holder Manager or Poker Tracker. It's from the same company. It's dependent on your preferences, which one you prefer. And then you will have in online games a heads up display. And then you don't have to pay that close attention. And you can easily play more tables. And you will still have stats like. Full to seabed, for example, full to seabed flop, full to seabed turn, full to seabed river, or continuation bets. That's very helpful and way more accurate than you could could do it on your own. So yeah, this can help to decide um, which side you are on. So um, for example, is this guy more here, so I can seabed more, or is it is he too loose, and I have to. Uh, go down with my bluffs but increase my value range or is he maybe in the middle and you have to stick to gdo yeah um 
also, what you have to keep in mind, this is exploiting your opponent. And you should not overdo it. I mean, if you seabed relentlessly against someone who has like full seabed 70%, you basically have an auto profit, he will not notice this probably. And you should not do it to the biggest extent possible. I mean, it could be the case that he's like a multi-tabling regular who will not recognize anyways. And if you play six-handed or even nine-handed, you will not have that many hands against this guy. And he might not recognize that you have 100% seabed range. But if it's a heads up and you seabed every single flop, he will recognize and we will recognize very fast. So in this case, it's probably better to mark him and don't slaughter him. So don't do the 100% seabetting range, but just increase it. Um, yeah, not in a way that he might recognize, but that he remains uh, playing suboptimally. Uh, but yeah, people will obviously recognize when he gets seabed all the time. It's the process is way slower, or he might never recognize if he's multi-tabling and you don't play many hands against him. But if you meet him more regularly, you also have to look for balancing, for example. And this means um, that you have a, should have a strategy where you have bluffs and value bets and your opponent is not able to distinguish between, between the two and cannot make optimal decisions. I mean... If you would only bet for value and he figures figures it out, he can always fold when he has nothing, and you or a weak hand that doesn't beat your value range, and you don't want that to happen. So, balancing is also another thing that you have to keep in mind. So that's basically my um, approach to sea bets. GTO against unknowns or people who play close to the optimal frequencies. By the way, um, also. Pay attention on how your opponent behaves on certain board textures and stuff. Because it could be the case that the overall stat seems to be correct. But he's still doing everything wrong. For example, he might be never folding on monochrome boards, but always uh, fold on paired boards, boards. I mean, to make an extreme example. And then he's, he's obviously not playing GTO, just... Randomly, the overall percentage adds up to 50% of whatever he is supposed to um, to call to see bets, <laughs> And that's why, um, yeah, you, you, I mean, you get the point. Still pay attention and don't look at the overall all stat only. Yeah, if someone is too tight, you can bluff him more. And if someone is too loose, you should go down with your bluffs. And uh, increase your, um, hence you bet for value. Okay, this was uh, my take on it, and let's now come to the Gelfond. But before we start, you should consider to check out my other channel too. It's called Finance with Excel. It's also, uh, there's also a link in the description. It's about money, finance, crypto, and I think this is a great channel, but for some reason it, it's not growing anymore, and... I have way less um, subscribers and people watching my content than I would like to be. And it's great content, at least in my eyes. Maybe I'm biased. Yeah, check it out if you are interested in uh, finance and money stuff as well. So now, without further ado, let's see what Phil Garfond has to say. And let's also restart the overlay. Oh, let's just... Do you want to perfect and memorize a killer flop bet strategy? Here's my advice don't. So on Run It Once, there's a PLO solver tool called Vision, uh, which has a function called streak. The way that streak works is you can either pick a spot or just pick a street. So for example, facing flop C bets in single raise pots, and it will feed you hands. You have 15 seconds. Some advertisement for his product, but uh, I mentioned it already. And to choose an action and it tells you whether you're right or wrong. And then you accumulate the longest streak possible without getting an answer wrong. And Streak has leaderboards. So one day I was bored and I thought, you know, I, I have studied a lot of heads up PLO. It, it, they have separate features for heads up and six max. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try today to 
to crack some of these leaderboards and see how I can do. So I spent a lot of time going through, you know, different streets. Long story short. What do you think? Did he mention, uh, did he make it to the leaderboard or did he fail? My guess is he probably didn't do it because people have very high scores very often and he's not the GTO guy. He's just adjusting very well to his opponents is, is, is my uh, take on him. He's also not playing that active anymore. So let's see what, what happened. Forward, I, I realized that I couldn't crack into the top few of these lists. I expect to have a good chance to, uh, first of all, because I, I study a fair amount. I don't know exactly who these people are. They're just screen names. Yeah, they are also investing way more time probably than him. By the way, I once made a, leader, a good leaderboard um, placement in the app when I still uh, had it purchased. But I'm pretty sure none of them would want to play against me. That has a PLO. So I figured if, if my overall skill is better than theirs, and I have studied with this tool quite a bit, I could compete very well. Then it turns out that I couldn't. And there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that when I study, I like to take a solver strategy and simplify it so that it's when I can more easily execute at the table. So for example, yeah, I find like heuristics and stuff and the, the a logic behind what the solver is doing and don't try to memorize every single thing. This is not working out. Single raise pot, I check call a continuation bet, turn comes out, whatever it may be. I never have a leading range. I never lead turn, no matter what the card is, uh, no matter what the flop was, no matter what the turn card is. Some players opt to have leads there. Vision and solvers in general do have leads there, but I believe they add such little EV. I think um, when you simplify, you should make sure that this is not costing you too much EV. But if it's possible to simplify without losing too much EV, it makes a lot of sense to simplify. And they complicate my own strategy and my own studying and my ability to execute my strategy. And when you try to execute a more complicated strategy, it's more likely that you're going to have a huge hole somewhere in your game. And if you're. Yeah, I think it's, uh, for example, very hard if you have like 10 different bet sizes on the flop. It's very hard to make this a balanced thing and that nobody can figure out something when he is betting small, he's always weak or he's, or he's more often weak when he's supposed to do it. So. I recommend to not uh, have a game tree that is insanely large because you will make a mistake and at some point. So keep it simple, but try to not uh, lose too much EV in the process. Your opponent figures it out, they can take advantage. The second reason is just that despite having studied heads of PLO a lot, these people... Yeah, by the way, the tools I recommended, uh, Holder Manager and Poker Tracker, the heads up display and tracking software work for um, many um, variants of poker, but the solvers I introduced are just for Potman Omaha. Well, it obviously studied more than I have. Again, I'm making assumptions, but why is it that these people who could score much higher in this leaderboard competition, um, why can't they beat me in heads up PLO? The reason is that getting the perfect flop C bet strategy is just not that important. And what's really important in poker is understanding the concepts behind optimal play. Mm, yeah, I think he's partly right. I think um, also a big thing why he's more successful than others is that he is probably making better adjustments because these hardcore study guys are often like just in this trap to always try to go with the GTO and the balanced approach. But this is simply, simply said bullshit. You want to make the max amount and maximize your winnings. And this is not by always playing GTO. Other people have big leagues and you want to exploit these leagues. And if you don't do it, but stick to GTO, you let leave a lot of money on the table. Solvers don't just think about how to play a, an individual spot and then get to a new spot and they think, okay, how do I play this individual spot? Well, they, they might kind of do that, but the, uh, programmatically, but the way that, that the strategy comes together, they're really accounting for every street. They're thinking forwards and backwards. You know, with, with AI, whether it be solver or otherwise. Yeah, solvers just ran the same um, spot hundreds of thousands of times against an opponent who's also playing perfectly. And then it slowly can figure out which line is the best one to take. It's just like 
yeah, testing the same the strategy like hundreds of thousands of times and then finding out which is the best. You don't get to see the the thought process because there is no thought process. It's just calculating something. And so learning from a solver, it's kind of the opposite of learning from a teacher where a teacher will walk you through, okay, so what do you think about this? Oh, why is that? Okay, so what do you think that means about this? And they, they walk you through the thought process and then you give them the answer. The solver does the opposite. It just tells you the answer and it doesn't tell you why. And so your job when you're studying solvers is to fill in the blanks there because if all you have is the answers and no context, you're not going to be able to apply those answers when you're trying to figure them out on your own because you have a human mind, you have to go through a human thought process. So, Yeah, it's, um, it's easier probably to remember a lot of stuff in No Limit Hold'em, but once you play PLO with way more combinations of things, you have to uh, simplify in, in a certain way or find heuristics. And often it is, um, if you have one spot, don't remember just this one, but... Often you can uh, carry over the findings to similar spots, and that's what uh, makes a good poker player. So get the answers from the solver, and then try to connect the dots, see why it might have done what it did. Now, there are a lot of hands that show up in your flop c-betting range. Let's use a hold'em example. He, by the way, did not share any c-bet strategy yet. He's just telling you some concepts um, based on GTO and, and solver stuff. for example, where on a board of 10, 8, 3, 2 spades, you might do a lot of C betting with a hand like 9, 4 with the 9 of spades. Um, now, that hand has really low equity, but on a run out of, you know, jack of spades, king, it's going to have a hand that can triple barrel because if you're only betting draws, when a board runs out in a certain way, you have no air left to bluff with. So what are you going to bluff with? So part of what a solver does is it, it puts hands in there that have blockers to hands that you want to represent later. It barrels off with them when those hit, sometimes when they don't hit too, because actually your draws that you bet flop with and turn with end up being worse river bluffs because they block your opponent having those draws that you want them to fold. So a lot of times these hands that are really weak bet flop because of certain blocker effects, and then they vary. Yeah, for example, um, the hand you had, you were block either blocking the flush draw with one spade and he also blocked certain straight draws and these hands are obviously very weak because with straight and flush draws your opponent often also does not have the has a pair and yeah you get the air portion to fold and you block the air although is this even true whether i am talking right now <laughs> yeah disregard that i mean it's bad that you uh, block his draws but once one of these draws hit then it's good for you because then you can move on with your bluff because uh, you can wrap it and you make it less likely that your opponent has something. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion. I often continue betting, well, depending on the turn card and the river card. If you bet these hands on the flop and you don't bet them later, your flop bet is a clear mistake. You're losing a lot of money with your flop bet. Some would say, no, you're losing money with your lack of turn and river bet. And technically you're right, and you are, but you're also losing money with your flop bet because this is a really low equity hand. Kind of the only reason it shows up in the betting range is that it can be still air on a lot. Of yeah, I think that's often a mistake. Uh, many lower stakes and mid stakes guys make. They are having like a one and done uh, strategy with your continuation bets, but you also should fire some turns and rivers and don't give up too um, easily. Draw completing, uh, draw completing runouts. But if you're not going to bluff with it on those draw completing runouts, then it's just a really weak hand that you're putting in. Okay, he has like three minutes left to reveal his flop seabed strategy. He hasn't started yet. Money with. You don't want to start bluffs with hands that can only, more or less, only become bluffs. And so getting the, the flop seabed strategy absolutely perfect doesn't help you if you don't play it absolutely perfectly on the turn and, and perfectly on the river, or near perfectly on the turn and river. What's really important in poker is understanding the concepts behind what optimal strategy is, why a solver is betting these hands, what it can value. He is also focusing way too much on optimal strategy. Uh, poker, you want to make money, and you make money playing against people who play suboptimal. 
And if you play against people who play close to optimal, you are doing something right. Uh, right, <laughs> that's, that's wrong. You're doing something wrong, in my opinion, because, yeah, you want to make the most amount of money. You can be a terrible player if the guys you are playing against are even are way worse still. And that's the thing. You don't need to be the world's best player. You need to get into the best games. That's most important. Bet across two streets, across three streets, what make the best bluffs, what attributes do hands have that make them good bluffs, what hands that are pretty good check back and why. Are they pot controlling? Do they give you good board coverage on certain turns for your check back range? Is it if you don't make those check backs, your opponent... Oh, what I forgot to mention, often it is good to have a polarized uh, flop betting strategy. This means that you bet the top part and the bottom part or most of it. I mean, some you have to slow play for balancing purposes some of the time, but yeah, this is basically what you want to do. So you don't want to bet only the bottom part. I mean, that makes no sense. And you also don't want to bet the top only because in case you don't bet, your opponent can easily put you on hand. I would get to do X, Y, and Z to take advantage. There are so many things that you need to consider and think about that learning specific CVET strategy, it just kind of doesn't matter. What matters is that you can think through every situation that comes with this is more like general advice and not seabedding strategy at all is he really preparing these videos <laughs> or is it this he did he get it and then just starts talking i mean i even i also did prepare much i mean i thought like two minutes about it but <laughs> this, this, has, this has nothing to do with flop seabedding strategy so far or, or not not as much as we would think of given that the title of this video is my flop seabed strategy with your human mind uh not a computer because you don't you don't get to bring that solver with you and uh consult it at every point so the thing is you can perfect preflop strategy you can just memorize what hands to play preflop and you can probably get really really close yeah learning preflop is very easy nowadays with solvers and again don't always stick to it. If people divide a lot from this optimal strategy, you obviously have to adjust still. To a flop seabed strategly. But Be given how Because uh, obviously GTO is expecting your opponent to play optimal as well. And if your opponent doesn't do that, you have a good point to divide from GTO as well. How many flops and, and then turn combinations, how many different things that can happen throughout a hand you just have no chance of memorizing anywhere close to a, a, a turn strategy and a river strategy, especially once you take into account, it's not always going to go uh, check back call, check back call. Sometimes it'll go check back raise. Sometimes it'll go check back call, check check on the turn and, and the river is whatever the river brings. Trying to... Yeah, that's also a mistake many people make. They only learn pre-flop strategy when they might still do a bit of a flop strategy. And then they completely forget about turn and river or do it very, very rarely. And yeah, if you have flop and free flop dealt down, it's time to move on to the other streets. I mean, they come less often, so the value uh, of learning these two might appear smaller, but keep in mind that once you get to the turn of the river, the pot is also way bigger. So this might, oh, should balance it out. Build your strategy through memorization, I believe, is, is just kind of a hopeless effort. Sure, memorize preflop ranges. That's good. For the most part, you're... Yeah, if you are not a savant, <laughs> then he's right. Your post-flop leaks will not impact what you can play preflop too much. They will a little bit, but memorize preflop, fine. Get a good idea of, of what hands about flop and for what sizing, and, and, and that's important. But what's more important is understanding the concept between what is the solver trying to do here with small bets? What's it trying to do with big bets? Why on this? Yeah, I think general is general good advice is to look at a certain boards like monochrome, two-tone, rainbow, paired boards, high cut, low cut, bar cut boards, and have a general understanding on how much you are supposed to uh, continuation bet given the position you are in and yeah, the whole situation pre-flop. Uh, that you don't overshoot or undershoot the percentages you should have 
by a lot. For example, on a monochrome board, you're not ex not expected to bet a lot. And you should know that because people can take advantage if you divide too much from these strategies. I mean, this does not necessarily mean that they do, but they could. And yeah, keep it in mind. I mean, if someone folds 80% for a seabed, it would still fire everything, even if it makes no sense from a GTO standpoint, but this guy is just folding all the time. So what should I do? I just have to exploit him and make the most money out of him. This board, is it betting big? And on this board, it's betting small. What are these hands that can value bet two streets and check back river? What are these hands that can value bet three streets? What prefers to go bet, flop, check, turn, bet river? What turn cards change the sizing that I use or the betting frequency that I use drastically? There are so many of these factors to think about. Getting this is already a near monumental task. Actually trying to memorize um, solver outputs is, I mean, I think it makes sense to have one or at max two sizing for most streets. At least for PLO in uh, No Limit Hold'em, you, it might make sense to have some more, although not too much, I think. Two sizings should be enough almost always. Is that times a thousand. And so unless you have a photographic memory, and even which, I don't know. I don't know any player who, who's memorized solver strategy or come anywhere close to it. Hopefully what you take away from this is not don't study. You absolutely should study if you want to improve. Studying is a fantastic way to improve, but the way- But you should also think at the table. That's also important takeaway. The way that you should study is- Also, important advice for Phil Garfond. If you make a video about flop seabed strategy, this should be about flop seabed strategy and not about general strategy and how to use a solver and, <laughs> and yeah, how, how to memorize things or- whatever it was about it's not about uh, his flop seabed strategy i mean it, at least not to the de to a degree which you would expect uh, reading the title is not through memorization it, it's through taking solver outputs applying human logic so that you can internalize it you can digest it and when you find yourself in any spot you can go through your human thought process and try to figure out your best although what you have to give him credit for he is um He's like someone who is, I mean, let's say you are hungry and he could give you fish, but this will only yeah, help you one time. But instead he could show you how to fish and then you could feed yourself all the time. And that's a bit what he's doing because he's not saying what he does, but he says sort of how you can figure out your own good strategy. Although my approach is better, I, I think, and my advice so far. And yeah, he only has like 30 seconds left. I don't expect much more to come, as he also will do the outro too. Best guess as to what to do there. I don't know what a solver would do in every spot in Heads Up PLO, but I know how to think through every spot in PLO like a solver so that when I do find myself in a very strange spot, I'm going to get close enough, so I'm not going to lose much EV. Thank you for watching. Hopefully that was helpful for you. I'm making a big push right now to make more and more videos. Okay, yeah. I hope this was helpful. At first, my seabed strategy. Afterwards, some general advice from Phil Garfond and my take on it. Yeah, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, share, all the good things. Check out my other channel. Yeah, good luck at the tables. Until next time. Bye-bye.